two. This is episode 177 of the Rio Grande Foundation's Tipping Point New Mexico podcast. I'm Paul Guessing, president of the Rio Grande Foundation, New Mexico's free market think tank. You can find out more about the foundation at riograndefoundation.org. This week, I am pleased to be joined by Josh Blackman. He is Associate Professor of Law at South Texas College of Law in Houston. He specializes in constitutional law, the U.S. Supreme Court, the intersection of law and technology. Uh, Josh is the author of three books, Unprecedented, The Constitutional Challenge to Obamacare, Unraveled, Obamacare, Religious Liberty and Executive Power, and An Introduction to Constitutional Law, 100 Supreme Court Cases Everyone Should Know. Welcome to Tipping Point New Mexico, Josh. Thank you so much for having me. My first time in New Mexico. Happy to be here. Yeah, and uh, by the time this podcast is public, the uh, Rio Grande Foundation and New Mexico chapter of the Federalist Society will have uh, co-hosted an event at the UNM Law School with uh, Josh Blackman on 100 Supreme Court cases in 60 minutes. And uh, that is quite the epic ride. So why don't you talk about that book really quick? Because just from a purely publishing uh, standpoint, it's rather innovative in the way you approach uh, a very old technology of dead paper books. Well, my colleague at Georgetown, Randy Barnett, and I, <clears throat> we publish a constitutional law case book. And this is this, you know, 1500 page doorstop that only law students would ever afford. And we realized that this entire volume of, of law um, can really be distilled down to 100 cases. And these are the cases that I think everyone should know. Anyone who wants to be conversant in the Constitution should know. And what we did, we wrote very short discussions of each case, two to three pages each. And the idea is you can read through this book all the way through, or maybe one chapter at a time, or even jump around to give yourself an overview of where the Supreme Court has ruled over the past two centuries. We also innovated. We developed a video library. Um, we took audio from the Supreme Court, and we mixed it with our own discussion of the case. We took photographs, videos of the parties, maps, and other pieces of media, and we created this entire library, 11 hours in length, that allows you to binge watch constitutional law. It's a really innovative process, and uh, we're so excited. It's It's been taking off in ways we did not even anticipate. Yeah, now uh, you're part of the Federal Society, and they uh, they have a uh, mindset, if you will, when it comes to the law, that they're conservatives and libertarians interested in the current state of the legal order. Uh, any... You know, want to want to share a little bit about who you are and your philosophy. Uh, do you have maybe a more libertarian outlook, a more conservative outlook? Uh, when you when you someday are uh, being uh, grilled in front of Congress for your court <laughs> God, seat, Lord help uh, you. What what would you uh, respond to the your ju judicial philosophy question? Um, I appreciate it. Uh... I've given some thought to this, but thankfully I'm not a judge, so I don't give a lot of thought. Uh, but I start from very basic principles. Um, text matters. Uh, the original meaning of the Constitution uh, really matters. And when judges construe provisions of the Constitution, they should always start with uh, text and history. Um, there's always questions of what role stare decisis precedent plays. Um, when you're a lower court judge, you have a little bit uh, 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 of a of a of a, you have a very short leash because there's not much you can do given precedent. Uh, when you're Supreme Court justice, precedent doesn't work the same way. Uh, polit politically, I tend to be quite libertarian. Um, I don't. I'm not very socially conservative. Uh, although increasingly, I, I've uh, in the last couple of years, I found myself defending policies that I don't very much agree with. Uh, and in immigration, I'm pretty. I'm pretty lax on immigration enforcement. I don't think it's a good use of resources, and I think we could stand to benefit from lots of people who want to come here. Uh, but unfortunately, our, our laws are quite draconian, and so long as the laws are on the books, they, they should be enforced. And uh, I'm hesitant when either courts or executives try to deviate from the laws as they are written. Well, let's talk about that, because uh, you know I think most libertarians do have a pretty 
uh, open view of immigration policy, but they also prefer a system. And of course, Congress is in charge of creating those systems. Mm -hmm. Uh, Presidents execute systems theoretically put in place by Congress. And one of, you know, I'm no lawyer. Uh, I study business in school. I run a free market think tank. We don't do immigration. But one of the things that I understand about our immigration policy is that uh, they ha- the Congress has empowered presidents, including, you know, it's kind of, as long as they did it, broadly speaking, this kind of middle center left way, everybody was okay. And I think that applies to both trade and immigration. But once you step out, as Trump has, of that uh, kind of centrist approach, there's a whole different uh, thought process that kicks in with Congress. And so talk about legally and with regard to the, the courts, because that is on a very uh, regular basis now being discussed, including a very uh, uh, bombastic, I don't know, a uh, uh, Sotomayor, uh, Justice Sotomayor had a recent, uh, you'll, you'll have to describe it, a letter, if you will, or a, a dissent in which she had a lot to say about immigration policy. So I'll, ta- I'll let you take it because you're the lawyer. <laughs> Oh, there's a lot there. Let me unpack it one piece at a time. The major immigration law we enacted was passed in the 1960s, and there were some follow-up laws passed in the 80s and the 90s. Uh, But for the most part, we've had zero immigration laws enacted in the last two decades. We just haven't had much. Um, What does that mean? Um, The immigration laws we have are in no way geared to the sorts of immigrants coming to the United States now. Um, We have... Uh, uh, different types of asylum regimes. We have a significant population in the United States who uh, uh, perhaps came to the United States legally but overstayed a visa. We have people who uh, came to the United States as children through uh, perhaps no fault of their own. These are the so-called dreamers. Um, We have lots of needs for immigration laws, and Congress has shown no interest in actually enacting them. Uh, We had a bill called the DREAM Act, which would have given some sort of status to the dreamers. I think this was a good bill. It came up for a vote several times and never got enough support. Uh, we had a comprehensive immigration bill, the Gang of Eight, if you remember that from some mm-hmm. years ago, that came close to passing but couldn't get through the House because of some opposition. Uh, and I think uh, uh, opposition to immigration laws has become even more politicized in the last couple of years with President uh, Trump's administration. So that, leaves, that means we're stuck, right? We're stuck with old laws that were passed at a very different time. And presidents of both parties have now tried to um, look to these old laws to uh, take new executive actions. Uh, President Obama had two big deferred action policies, uh, DACA as well as DAPA. Uh, The DAPA policy was halted, but the DACA policy still is in effect. And it's before the Supreme Court right now will decide whether the policy is legal, whether President Trump can suspend it. Um, President Trump has also enacted some very ambitious and, and aggressive immigration laws. Uh, uh, the Remain in Mexico policy, limitations in asylum, and more than I can even count at the moment. And the question always is this, do these old laws enacted decades ago give the executive broad discretion to uh, take these steps? Uh, I generally read discretion narrowly. I think if Congress wants to deal with an issue, Congress should deal with it, and it should not be up to an overweening executive to uh, uh, sort of look through the crevices of statutes and find uh, new types of authority. And that's kind of a, a more libertarian approach to the law in general, a skepticism of the executive, no matter which party they are of, right? Yeah, I'm skeptical of governmental power, whoever wields it, um, uh, <laughs> generally. Um, if the president has a statute that seems to clearly delegate a power, uh, then I'm okay with the president exercising it. If the president relies on a statute that says nothing about the issue at hand, my first instinct is, did Congress address this issue? And if Congress failed to address this issue, then the president perhaps is stepping out of line. Of course, another law that had broad discretion for the executive baked into it and just had a important decision from the Supreme Court in terms of hearing a case, and that's often the most interesting aspect of some of the Supreme Court discussions is whether you are hearing the case or not. Uh, but uh, Obamacare, you've written a lot about it. Uh, again, the law uh, had broad discretion for the executive. There's a lot of different policies inherent in it, and the case deals with taxation and how that law 
uh, came to be uh, legal or not. And the funny story about Obamacare before I toss this over to you. So the morning of the original decision, uh, when Roberts kind of saved the law through some creative interpretation, uh, about four in the morning, my middle child was born. Okay. And so my wife and I were June, all in June the, 20th, 2012. Yeah. We're in the yeah. recovery room at the hospital. And I know that Obamacare is being handed down by the Supreme court in the decision. And so, you know, I'm exhausted. My wife is both on drugs and exhausted. And we're sitting there watching TV because this decision is coming down. And of course that morning, all the media people are saying, Obama has been overturned by the U S Supreme court. So I'm thinking, yes, healthy daughter and Obamacare overturned. And we turn off the TV, yeah. we're hanging out, just talking about other stuff. And uh, 10, 15, 20 minutes later, I turn the TV on or pay back, pay attention back to it. And everybody's saying, Obamacare has been upheld by the, by the Supreme Court. And I thought, I wasn't that tired. I remember <laughs> this so-and-so you know, on TV saying, that it was overturned 10 minutes ago, and now they're saying it's been upheld. What gives? Anyway, uh, just a personal story about that particular case, and of course you've written about it. So uh, talk about you know, your, your writing on Obamacare. You've written a couple books. What, what is overall your impression of this law and uh, its constitutionality and how the court's going to grapple with it yet again? I have a, I have a similar story. Um, in on June twentieth, twenty twelve, the date of your child's birthday, I had a flight to London, um, which was scheduled in advance, and we were supposed to leave from Chicago O'Hare around ten thirty um, uh, Eastern time. And usually, the Supreme Court releases their opinions at ten Eastern time. So, I'm like, okay, whatever. I'll download the opinion and then read it on the plane. There was no Wi Fi back then. I'll download the opinion, read it on the plane. So we're sitting there on the tarmac, and we're boarding, we're boarding, and something's odd. We're in Chicago here, and things are moving quickly. We're on time. There's no delays. And then we start taxiing, and I realize, wait a minute, this might not work. And uh, they decide one case, and I download that opinion. They decide a second case, download that opinion. And then I'm still waiting for the decision. And then as we're taxiing, I get a, a message, and it, it's alert says, the Supreme Court declared Obamacare unconstitutional. Oh, my God, this is it, right? This is it. And then I still don't have the opinion because the website was flooded. We're about to take off, and I get this last-minute uh, message from my girlfriend who wrote, Chief Justice voted to uphold the law as a tax. And then silence for eight hours as we crossed the pond. It was cathartic. <laughs> you know, in, in hindsight, I'm actually grateful for that For that. For that solipsism, whatever word you want to use, that, that sort of isolation where I had nothing, just the the entire world was beneath me. I had no idea what was going on. There was no Wi-Fi, nothing. I was like, huh. I finally landed at Heathrow around midnight local time. It was quite late. And I stayed up all night reading the entire opinion. I was like, wow. And at the time, I basically finished my book, my first book, Unprecedented. And I had to rewrite the entire ending because <laughs> I was like, huh, that, that was not what I expected would happen. So I had to do a lot of rewrites. And the book was published later the next year. Um, but here we are again, nearly nine, not your kid's nine years old now, right? Almost nine. Uh, eight, eight well, and no, change. she'll be eight. Yeah, oh, she'll be oh eight, okay. Yeah. I, I can't count. <laughs> so we're, we're nearly eight years away and we'll get a decision when your kid's about to turn nine. Um, Obamacare feels like the movie Groundhog Day. Uh, but instead of Bill Murray, we have John Roberts where he just sort of keeps coming back into the exact same fold, uh, 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 uh taunting us about what's going to happen. Um, I don't know which way the court will go here. Uh, I happen to think this case has some merit. I'm the only one. People think I'm insane, uh, but I'm used to that sort of reaction. Yeah, it'll be interesting. It would have been nice if he just made the principled slash right decision uh, right at the time and we wouldn't have to deal with this. And of course, uh, I know it's a political question more so than a, a legal question, but we've seen all the presidential candidates on the Democratic side not exactly – Jumping to the defense of Obamacare, all of them want to use Obamacare as a starting off point or go full bore, of course, like Bernie and Elizabeth Warren towards much more aggressive Medicare for all. And it's exactly what a lot of conservative healthcare analysts and policy analysts said at the time was that that decision was just a stepping stone to nationalize healthcare. And I, I think that's being borne out politically, at least at this point. So, right. I, I don't. 
<clears throat> you know, I think it's very unlikely the court kills all of Obamacare. Maybe parts of it are set aside. Um, but whether this, this country goes down the road further of uh, Medicare for all, these other policies, I think is going to be a political question. Uh, if the court does decide that all of Obamacare is unconstitutional, um, that will put the Republicans in a very tough position uh, because they don't have a backup ready. Yeah. Right? They've had a decade, and they don't have a backup ready. And the fact of the matter is people have come to rely on the ACA, and, and it would cause a massive disruption. So I think it's unlikely we see that sort of ruling, but I'm always wrong. I don't make predictions anymore. <laughs> well, it's much like the immigration question we just talked about. You know, uh, just because what Congress X does might be seen as unconstitutional or partially unconstitutional doesn't mean that Congress is willing or able to uh, do something that is different to address the real concerns that people have in whatever policy area they're talking about. Yeah, I, I think that's right. Um, most people, and I don't mean this, this is a slot, as a slight, but most people have a difficult time separating law and policy. Uh, most people think that anything that's good policy is legal and anything that's bad policy is illegal. Um, right. And I don't, I don't mean that in, to, to, to mock them. I think it's a very natural inclination. You're drawn towards what you like and you're repelled from what you dislike. When I go about my legal analysis, I try to think not only do I like something or dislike it, but what would the law be independently? You know, if we look through, through the veil of ignorance, we know nothing else. What's the right answer? And that's how I try to frame my, <clears throat> my approach to the law. But I realize that leads me in unpopular positions very often. Yeah. Um, so let's, uh, before we get started on some of the Supreme Court cases that you like or find the most compelling or interesting or influential, uh, I got to do a little more prognostication, more politics. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll see if Trump can win re-election. I'm assuming that Ginsburg uh, is, Justice Ginsburg is holding out on retiring until her, I guess at this point, either Bernie or... Uh, Bloomberg or one of the Democrats wins. Uh, I I assume that you think that she would hang it up regardless uh, after if Trump won election, but you know maybe not immediately, maybe down the road. Uh, How I, many... I think they're going to have to weaken at Bernie. Her, <laughs> I don't think she's going anywhere. She's going to try to stick it out. So you you think um... she's not retiring voluntarily? I'll put it that way. All right. Well, uh, and. Uh, any other justices up for replacement you think might be uh, uh, available for Trump during a, a next Unless year? something happens with Justice Sotomayor or Breyer or Kagan, which I'm not expecting, I don't think any of the Democratic nominees will step down. <clears throat> Excuse me. And most of their folks are a little older than the Republican side. Uh, they Thomas, are. Thomas is getting up there. Thomas is a young man, though. Thomas, Thomas and, and, and Alito are only a couple years apart. Uh, Thomas was put in the court when he was very, very young. Um, I don't know that Thomas wants to retire. I think he's having a blast. I, people don't understand him. I think he's probably our most influential justice by far, by far. And um, he has a network of clerks that are now becoming judges themselves. It's really a remarkable job he's done from someone who gets so much hate from every corner. And he's just such a humble, thoughtful guy. Uh, uh, I hope he sticks around. I'll be frank. I don't think anyone Thomas, I don't, I don't think anyone Trump picks could beat Thomas. I think Thomas is better than anyone else on the short list. So yeah, he's to one hundred to one hundred twenty. Should Clarence Thomas go? Okay. So how old is Breyer? Eighty something. Okay. Seventy nine or eighty. And Ginsburg is eighty five well. or eighty six. It has had a number of health issues. So, uh, but you think they will not? Not go quietly into that good night. Not go Trump... quietly into the night. No, no, I don't think that's going to happen. All right. Well, uh, I, I, Supreme Court, I have to say, and I'm, I'm not going to go down this path with you because it's too, perhaps, titillating, too interesting to have two, you know, Breyer's kind of a moderate center left, I guess. Uh, Ginsburg's definitely uh, among the liberal vanguard. But if those two are rotated out for Trump nominees, that definitely changes the... I, you know... Republicans have a very bad history of picking Supreme Court candidates who are consistent. They're terrible. The Democrats are batting a thousand. They, they, they don't have any problems. So I think if you have seven Republican appointed majorities, you'd have a consistent five for majority for the conservatives. I think you need seven. 
<laughs> but Trump Trump has done uh, a better job than even Reagan in terms of I, I think I mean maybe maybe I'm this is my layman speaking, but uh, I, I think Trump has done uh, a very good job. Oh, he has, he has. But look, I, I, I think there may be cases where Kavanaugh surprises you. I think there'll be cases when Gorsuch surprises you. But if you're asking to have a consistent conservative majority, I think you need seven. Yeah. Well, Kavanaugh was and Rob, always, Robert surprises as well. And I think I, I almost think Kavanaugh was a strategic nomination by Trump to placate the George W. Bush wing of the uh, Republican Party to try to at least throw the more traditional wing of the GOP a bone uh, in terms of one of their guys being put up into that high office because mm -hmm. yeah, he's not as Kavanaugh's not a, not as ideologically conservative I don't think as uh, Gors uh, yeah Gorsuch so anyway yeah. all right so uh, let's talk let's talk Turkey let's talk Supreme Court cases uh, I know. Uh, a hundred cases is way too much for any podcast of this length to go into. Although you're going to cover a hundred of them in sixty minutes, do you have a one or perhaps two most favorite, most compelling cases that you really think shape our lives in interesting ways? Preferably a good decision, but maybe it could be a uh, a negative decision or something that you disagree with. Talk about the. Favorite and most interesting cases uh, of the U.S. Supreme Court in it throughout its history, you know, or in recent years, it could be. You know, I I'll pick an obscure one that most people don't know, but I think is actually correct. And I'll pick this one because most cases I think are wrong in some regards. You know, there's almost every case in the book I can pick things off with it, but there's one that I think got it right from top to bottom. Uh, the case is called Barron v. Baltimore. It's an old case from the 1830s. Um, you had a situation where a guy had a harbor. Uh, he had a dock in Baltimore Harbor, and the city did some construction and flooded his property. Uh, they made it unusable because there wasn't enough water. The water became too shallow. As a result, uh, he sued the city of Baltimore for taking his property. Actually, uh, we call it taking. Um, the Fifth Amendment says if the government takes your property, they have to provide just compensation. Okay, good rule. But does the Fifth Amendment limit only the federal government? Or does a Fifth Amendment limit only the states? The Supreme Court held correctly that the Fifth Amendment only controls the federal government. It does not control the states. As a result, the Baltimore citizen would have to take up the, a problem with his own government. He couldn't sue under the federal constitution. I think the decision is correct. And in fact, we had a 14th Amendment which reversed that, which said that the, the, the Bill of Rights now does protect the states as well as the federal government. You know, why do I pick such a silly case? Because it's there's there's nothing to complain about. Uh, uh, the the Constitution was ratified to for limit federal power. The text of the Constitution suggests it limits federal power, and there are other provisions that limit the state. So it's an oldie uh, but a goodie. That one that I I quite like. Okay, so you're saying because you're talking 1835, you said now because that preceded yes. the adoption of the 14th Amendment. Yes, you would say that's correct. Okay, and one of the reasons why I like it, it shows that if you don't like a constitutional ruling. You can amend the Constitution to change it. And that's a very good lesson. We don't need the courts to reverse themselves left and right. Let the courts make a ruling. I think it's almost correct. And if we don't like it, amend the Constitution. I wish we did that more often. I think it would be a healthy uh, exercise for a polity. Well, I was going to ask you another takings question about the Kilo versus New London oh, case. Oh, that's a bad we, one. We can, I'll we talk can, about that if you we want. We can go back. Uh, but I want to talk about the Second Amendment then because... You're talking about amending the Constitution. Now, uh, you know, Rio Grande Foundation has engaged more actively on Second Amendment issues, especially with the advent of the red flag uh, legislation here in New Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, we talk about the, uh, well, First Amendment, you know, the founding fathers used paper and pens and mail that took weeks on end to get their free speech out in many ways. Second Amendment, you know, we've got the advent of nuclear missiles and uh, very, very powerful weapons. So is that an area that you think that they could amend the Constitution to address machine guns and nuclear weapons under the Second Amendment? Or, or you know, can, <laughs> Give me a process there, because we've kind of just come to this understanding in this country that 
no, you can't have machine guns unless you go through a permitting process and nobody's got uh, their own B-52 bombers or anything that, that I know of, certainly not with live nuclear weapons. So talk about that. Um, the Second Amendment provides a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Um, the Supreme Court went nearly two centuries without opining on the Second Amendment. Not till, excuse me, 2008 in D.C. v. Heller did the court actually discuss what that means. And Heller tells us the Second Amendment protects an individual right to keep and bear arms. Great. Wonderful. But what is an arm? Um, so far, the court has said the arms are those that are in common possession by the people. Um, what about, uh, you know, you mentioned machine guns or missile launchers, or nuclear weapons. Um, I don't know that the court will say you have the right to have an RPG. RBG will not give you a right to an RPG. That's for <laughs> damn sure. Um, but I think at a minimum, uh, uh, the court should recognize that a gun like an AR-15, which is in common use by millions of Americans, is an arm. In fact, if I were to show, you know, James Madison... An AR-15, you say, yeah, that kind of looks like a musket. I guess that's right. And there's a close analogy between the two. Um, so I, I, I do think that the court should get around to it, but the court's not been very gung-ho on the Second Amendment. They've taken very few cases, only a handful, and they've shown no interest in, in reviewing state bans on various types of so-called assault weapons. Yeah, and uh, you know, of course, when it comes to the courts, they've tended to allow, not just on the Second Amendment, but... There's always that legislative nibbling at the edges uh, thing that happens on any issue, uh, whether it's the First Amendment or the Fourth Amendment. I mean, I, they all, uh, the, the legislatures and Congress tend to uh, try to get, get away with things. Uh, I guess let's talk about the First Amendment then, McCain-Feingold and uh, then its reaction. I mean, the way uh, George W. Bush handled McCain-Feingold was reprehensible, in my opinion, which he uh, basically said, let them pass it and then let the courts decide. I mean, you're, you're the president of a frickin' country. Uh, make a decision based on the Constitution yourself. But uh, you're the constitutional scholar. I'll let you opine and weigh in on that one. And, and also the case that cleared things up, or maybe not cleared things up, but resolved at least part of that situation. So. Well, campaign finance law is one of these tricky things. Um, you know, if I go on your podcast and I say, I like this issue or I like that issue, there's no doubt that we're engaging in free speech. But I sit here in this beautiful studio with these microphones and these cameras and these uh, 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 very sophisticated equipment, and that stuff's not free, right? Someone, our good host, had to pay for this equipment, right? So in order to speak, Money is involved, right? Money has to be involved somewhere when you're engaging in speech. It's impossible unless you're just standing in a park by yourself shouting into the wind. You're going to need money. Uh, and once we accept that money is an essential ingredient in speech, we realize that limiting the money in politics limits your ability to talk about politics. And the core has drawn these sort of funny lines where Congress can limit how much money you contribute to a candidate but Congress can't limit how much you uh, spend on uh, issue advocacy related to an issue. I think this divide is kind of artificial, but that's the world that we live in. And uh, 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 these recent cases are merely asking, to what extent can Congress limit your ability to uh, uh, speak? Uh, uh, Citizens United is a case that's quite hated by many segments, but what was it about? A group wanted to make a movie, a movie critical of Hillary Clinton— and they want to air that movie shortly before the election. In my mind, the government should not be able to punish you for making a movie. And if you want to use corporate funds for that movie, so be it. Uh, I think the decision, uh, perhaps not correct in all its regards, but reached the right result. The government can't shut down a movie. You know, During the arguments, the question came up, can the government censor a book? What if corporate funds used to print a book? Can that be shut down? And the, the court said, no, you can't stop books can't stop movies, and you can't stop podcasts. I think the only thing that can stop a podcast is my heart stop in a few minutes, uh, so I think maybe we can seg there, but I'm very grateful for the uh, uh, for the opportunity to speak about these cases. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, and uh, I know we've just got a couple minutes to go, so I guess we will uh, 
wrap up on uh, uh, any worst Supreme Court cases, anything that you think the court really needs to revisit? Oh, yeah. The, uh... I got You mentioned earlier is Kilo. Yeah. Um, Kilo v. New London is a 2005 case involving eminent domain. Um, eminent domain is the power of the state to take property. Um, this case held that the state has a broad power to take property. If the state determines that they can turn your home into a uh, profitable office park or a hotel or a 7-Eleven or a Costco, if your property can generate more tax revenue by being repurposed, your property can be taken from you and converted to that usage and transferred to a private party. This was a 5-4 decision that I think is ripe for being overruled. Um, I don't think any state has relied on it. In fact, most states have opposed it. And I think we need to get that case off the 100 list and put into the uh, the trash bin. All right. Well, uh, thank you for visiting New Mexico. And thank you. thank you for listening to this week's podcast. Make sure to get the latest edition of Tipping Point New Mexico by subscribing to Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify. You can post or comment on this and other episodes on Facebook and Twitter. And tell Google Home to play Tipping Point New Mexico. Thanks to Path3 Marketing for producing this show.